The reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Oh, I can see the tabloid headlines now. Wacko Jacko on the verge of a nervous breakdown or perhaps sobbing for sympathy. What do you think about that one? Hello, I'm James Curtis. Welcome to E's exclusive coverage of the Michael Jackson trial. Late again. The King of Pop arrived at the court and walked slowly and stiffly with the help of one of his brothers and an aide, as it was reported. Then the singer left the courtroom for about 20 minutes. Jackson's spokesperson later told the media that the pop star had been suffering from excruciating back pain, and so it would seem. According to eyewitness accounts, before Jackson left the courtroom, he was visibly upset, trembled, and sobbed. Good job, Eddie. Once court got underway, though, Assistant District Attorney Ron Zonin questioned Anthony Urquiza. He's a child psychologist. Now, if you caught our program yesterday, we had our own expert right here on the program on E! News. Good job to all our producers. But here's what the jury heard in the courtroom from the prosecutor's expert, according to the courtroom transcripts. The child sexual abuse accommodation syndrome has five parts or components. I'll just identify them. They are a sense of secrecy, helplessness, delayed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, entrapment and accommodation, delayed and unconvincing disclosure. And then the last one is retraction. Tell us what the first one means, secrecy. In order to understand the concept of secrecy, actually in order to understand how children respond to being sexually abused, it's important to understand the context in which abuse occurs. And the context is a relationship between a perpetrator and a victim. One of the misperceptions that occurs or myths that occur with sexual abuse is that children are sexually abused by somebody they don't know. That's just not the case. Most children by far most children are sexually abused by somebody with whom they have an ongoing relationship, not a stranger. That's important because it sets up the dynamics for this issue of secrecy. Children tell us, and the research supports, that there's usually some type of mandate imposed upon the child to keep them quiet about the abuse, hence the term secrecy. This mandate can be something like a threat, threat of physical aggression or threat of coercion of some type. It can also be special attention, special favors, bribes. It can also be misinformation or informing the child of the bad consequences that would occur should they disclose all part of this mandate or this coercion meant to keep these kids quiet so they don't disclose. Next, District Attorney, Assistant District Attorney Ron Zonin explores another complex element of molestation cases, an element the prosecution undoubtedly intends to focus on. Delayed, unconvincing disclosure. What does that mean? Again, that's one that has two parts to it. Yes. The misperception is a good place to start. The common belief is if you're a child and you're being abused, then you will immediately, as soon as it happens, you'll immediately go tell your mom or your dad, your teacher, your best friend, someone. And that really doesn't happen very often. And that's why it's the misperception. It is common that children of a delay, and often a significant delay, in disclosure from the first time of abuse to when they're eventually able to disclose. There are now actually several studies that have looked at this issue of delayed disclosure. And one that I often cite is by Diana Elliott and John Breer, which found that from the time of the first incident of abuse to when the child discloses, that about three quarters of them had failed to disclose within the first 12 months. Excuse me? 12 months? 12 months. Thank you. So most kids don't disclose right away. What that means is that clearly there's a delay in disclosure. What I think that also means is whatever that mandate or coercion that was imposed on the child, that secrecy part must have been pretty strong if it keeps most kids quiet for at least a year. What are the issues that a child deals with in determining whether or not to disclose that they've been a victim of child sexual abuse? What do they wrestle with, kids? Well, I'll start by telling you that I often tell kids when I'm in therapy with them that it was a courageous thing for them to do because they are overcoming a lot of issues. They may be overcoming threats. They may be overcoming a sense that they're going to get in trouble if they disclose. Lots of times, kids feel like they're not going to be believed. They'll disclose to somebody and, you know, they'll get blamed for what happened. For a lot of children, especially males, 
there is this issue of stigma attached to homosexuality. That is, most perpetrators are male. And so for a male victim, not only do they have all of these other issues about being afraid to disclose, but if they disclose, the people will think that they're gay, that they're homo. I mean, those are the kinds of things that are teased or ridiculed by adolescents or peers. And so it becomes a very difficult thing. I believe the term, Sean, is res ipsa loquitur. It speaks for itself. This does a lot speaking for itself for the prosecution's case. Yes, and this expert has testified many times in court before, but it's no surprise that he's testified primarily for the prosecution. So what does that do for the case, Howard, the fact that this guy has testified on the prosecution's side? I'm so just what? trying to understand what delayed, unconvincing disclosure means. Does that mean delayed lying is okay? Oh, Howard, no, no, James, come on. Just as the experts admitted yesterday, this witness cannot testify to the truthfulness or lack thereof of that's any true, witness. That's true, that's true. But that's he does. Go ahead. He does. In this particular case, what this witness testifies to is that he has not had much experience with false accusations, believing, I think it's that only 2 to 6 percent yeah. of child accusations are false. So what he's testifying to is on the basis of truthful accusations. Exactly. So he's, he's, never, he's never interviewed this child. True. Which true. Is important. So he can't testify to this kid, but doesn't everything that he lays out here play exactly or describe just as well a kid who's lying as a kid who would be telling the truth? Yes. Isn't that the problem? Th that is the point. And by never interviewing Gavin, I think he lends really nothing to the case except theory, and he's not going to help the jury, in my opinion. And well, the jury's going to think he's going to help the jury. Yeah, exactly. Especially coming right now, because it's shoring up the testimony of Gavin to make the jury understand, from Mr. Snedden's point of view, well, of course this child didn't tell the truth at certain times. Of course this child delayed. Of course this child has trouble remembering. And Tom Mesereau doesn't get to bring his expert on for a long not time. Not yet, but then there is cross-examination. And will we see the expert who actually interviewed this kid? Well, now the psychologist seems to help the prosecution with its biggest problem. Doctor, a child who's been a victim of sexual abuse, would it be your expectation that each time the child is interviewed, assuming a succession of interviews or even testimonies, would it be your expectation that child would be perfectly consistent about all of the detail each and every time? The research supports that they are not likely to be consistent. Part of that is just this issue of it's a process in which they feel more comfortable disclosing so they may give more information. Part of it also is there's some areas in which kids are not attentive to. For example, children don't usually wear watches. And so if you were to ask a child, you know, did it happen at 2.30 or 3.30 in the afternoon? Did it last 35 minutes or 55 minutes? Their orientation to time is different than that of an adult. So they may not be accurate on issues of time. Not accurate on issues of time, Ricky, but what does that do for the key weapon of the cross-examiner, inconsistency? Well, inconsistency is one thing. Not being sure about time is another. And what this is doing, of course, as an expert, is saying, well, of course, Mr. Mesereau could cross-examine as to time with both Gavin and to Star, and who would expect a child to actually get it right? And that's going to be the big problem for the, uh, for the, pro well, for the defense in this case, but any cross-examiner, wouldn't it, Howard? Yes, but this is a witness I'd love to cross-examine. I'd love to see You want Sean. to cross-examine all no, these no, no, witnesses. No, 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 but this, I'd love to see Ricky or Sean cross-examine him. I mean, clearly, he's up there tailoring his testimony to bolster the prosecution's case. And I think that this is an expert that is... And, all right, real and, quick, Sean. And we all know that any lawyer can get any expert to say anything yeah, you want. There you just you go. go get Gun your expert. Get We're your gonna expert. We're going to come back and continue with this. These folks aren't going to be happy with this expert, no matter what he says when we return. <laughs> the psychologist faces defense attorney, no, not these folks, but Tom Mesro, of course, plus a flight attendant provides an odd beverage menu. But hey, this case is odd, isn't it? And that's really becoming the norm. Stay with us. Reenactments and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Why did the accuser and his brother behave the way they did after the alleged molestation? Well, psychologist and prosecution expert Anthony Urquiza provides this jury with some possible explanations. Here's what that jury heard according to the courtroom transcripts. 
Is it possible to use certain types of materials with a child that might lessen that child's sexual inhibitions? Well, as I said earlier, it's a difficult thing to just walk up to a child and stick a hand in their pants and start fondling them. And I don't mean to be crude about it, but that is a good example, because it's likely if you were to do that, that the child would would be offended repulsed, afraid, and difficult then to follow through and molest that child in a more extensive way. And you don't have to do that. What kids tell us happens is that they have this relationship. It's somebody that they like, somebody that they enjoy. They enjoy spending time with them. And some minor sexual content gets to be part of the relationship. It may be an off-color joke. It may be a comment about some girl's bottom or breasts that, who walked by. But it's a minor thing. And then over time, it may be watching an R-rated movie, making comments about people who don't have clothes on in an R-rated movie, or even more, introducing the issue of pornographic materials, X-rated magazines or videos, or touching the child. Is it uncommon for a child to act out in some fashion, a child who's been sexually abused? That can be very common, yes. Would that behavior include such things as talking back to teachers? That would be... Yes, that would be sort of a poor response to authority. Getting into fights. Getting into fights would be one. Explaining everything, it seems, for the prosecution. Well, the easy part was over for this expert witness, the psychologist on the stand for the prosecution. Now he dukes it out with defense attorney Tom Mesereau. You would agree that false claims of sexual abuse are made by children? Certainly. And none of the papers you've published have ever dealt with that subject, correct? Correct. That's not an area of research that I do. Let me give you a hypothetical question. You've got a mother and three children. There is no father figure present. There has been a traumatic divorce of recent vintage. For whatever reason, the mother and her children pick someone and adopt that person as the father figure. And they refer to that person as daddy. And they refer to that person as the father of the children. And the mother encourages the children to refer to that person in that light. And suddenly, there is a split. The mother, the children sense that the person they've adopted as their surrogate father, as their father figure, is bailing out, is getting out of the situation for whatever reason. You could imagine, couldn't you? as a professor of clinical psychology, a situation like that where the mother suddenly induces the children to make false claims of sexual abuse? It's difficult and maybe misleading to say, okay, well, there's these large number of kids who are making false allegations. The studies show that somewhere at least around 2 to 6% of kids who make allegations make allegations that are false or that may be false. So we're looking at a very small number of kids to begin with. And with what I would argue doesn't fit into that high percentage group that the research describes. But doctor, you know that in nasty divorces, very often one spouse will induce a child to falsely accuse another spouse, not just to get custody, to be nasty and to hurt the person. You know that happens every day, doesn't it? That may be your experience, but it's not supported by the research. That kids make false allegations related to being sexually victimized every day, or make a lot, I mean, those are words that you qualified with. The research does not support that. But Ricky Kleeman, this hypothetical, and hypothetical, of course, are those scenarios that the opposing counsel gets to paint for the expert to try to get them agree to agree with their side of the sure. case. Does he do a good job here, Tom Mesro, with this hypothetical? Well, I like his hypothetical in terms of all the facts that he puts in. What's interesting is that the real question is, is after you put in all these facts, all the facts that help you, and yeah. let me give you a hypothetical, suppose the following facts, is that what you say afterwards is, do you have an opinion? That never even came out here. So Tom Mesero got to suggest his whole idea without ever getting the opinion answered. And no objection, Howard. No objection, and he never really got an answer. The one question I would have loved to have asked this doctor is why exactly are you testifying in this case? What was your conversation with the district attorney's office? What did they tell you? And, and we'll see. how come you never interviewed or tried to interview these so-called victims? And we'll see if that's coming, right, well, Sean? Yeah, and it's so clear that it's tailor-made. I almost expect the question to be, would you expect to see kids throwing things off roller coasters? Would yeah. you expect someone to say, you know, I mean, it's just exactly and scripted would you and crafted to see the according to this would testimony. you expect to see Would you expect to see, absolutely, that's a, that's a great point. And would you expect to see this aberrant behavior before 
the molestation. Sean's timeline, she loves to talk about that. We're going to see one one of these days, too. Now, Mesro tries to reestablish a major part of the case for the defense. If you knew that an alleged child victim had experience in the legal system making claims and getting money from those claims, would that cause you any pause with respect to whether or not the child was telling the truth? I'm, uh, I don't think that's my area to answer. How come? Well, what I said earlier. I mean, if you're framing it within the context of false allegations, kids, in fact, do make false allegations. And when they make false allegations, the reasons that I provided earlier were in the context of divorce and issues of custody. I wasn't aware of, or I am not aware of, an instance where a child has made a false allegation specifically for the purpose of financial gain. It's possible, which is the question you just asked me, but I'm not aware of that. Nor am I aware of any research that's focused on the issue of financial gain and false allegations. All right, next, coffee, tea, or Jesus juice? Assistant District Attorney Gordon Auchincloss questions a flight attendant. Her name is Lauren Wallace. She talks about Jackson's beverage choice. Now, a programming note, she refers to a Cynthia Bell. She's another flight attendant for ExtraJet. Okay, tell me about that. How did that come about that you would put wine in a Diet Coke can? Miss Bell had informed me that it's something that he did. And so when I initially flew Mr. Jackson, I had emptied out three Diet Coke cans and filled them up halfway with white wine, kept them on ice for him, and he had them available for him upon boarding. Did you serve him wine in a Diet Coke can? Yes. I placed them there for him. Did he drink it? Yes. Maybe not all of it sometimes. Miss Wallace, did you ever hide alcohol on any of these flights for Mr. Jackson? Yes, I did. What did you hide? What alcohol did you hide for Mr. Jackson? I had little bottles of Tanqueray and tequila and maybe vodka. What are we talking about? The, the small airplane type bottles? Yes. Is those that... are called minis. Minis, okay. Yes. And where would you hide those bottles? It depended. Usually in the lab, above the children's reach. The lab is the lavatory in the bathroom of the airplane. And how would Mr. Jackson become aware of the location of the bottles? I would inform him. Initially, I informed him. But after a while, upon flying in the same aircraft, I figured that maybe he would know they were there for his disposal. Howard, good prosecution witness, but some good defense evidence in this witness. Well, I, I missed the part where she said she saw Mr. Jackson serving the alcohol to the minors. Yes. She wasn't asked the question because she couldn't have said she observed And I believe that. later on in her testimony, Sean, she actually gets to the point where she doesn't see that, but she does fit in keeping the alcohol out of reach of the kids. That's pretty good for the defense. It is good for the defense, but obviously what's good for the prosecution is that it corroborates what we've heard, that there's alcohol in these Diet Coke cans, which seem like a bizarre thing, but here's the corroboration. Yeah, absolutely, and let's be court. clear, this is not the flight attendant who was on the flight that is alleged to have happened, that's been testified about, well, but nonetheless, she be, Ricky, but she, It's not about this particular flight. Exactly. But what happens here is, is one of the things I think that's interesting is it's all white alcohol, tangere, tequila, vodka, white wine. Interesting observation. That that would not show up. And we have to remember there was a question about a rim of red. Yes, So yes. that's maybe wrong. Very good observation. And that nasty alcohol taste, rubbing alcohol, I think it was. When we return, can Tom Mesro make something positive out of wine in the can and gin in the john? Stay with us. and commentary in this program may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Why did Michael Jackson order camouflage Chardonnay and hidden tequila? Well, according to the courtroom transcript, here's the explanation given during cross-examination of that flight attendant. Okay. 
And your understanding was that Mr. Jackson did not want children seeing him drink alcohol, right? Yes. And it was your understanding that he wanted wine placed in cans because he didn't want children to see him drinking that wine, right? I'll object foundation and hearsay. Foundation sustained. Did you have an understanding as to why Michael Jackson wanted white wine placed in cans on the flights? Same objection. Overall, you can answer yes or no. Yes. Would you please tell the jury what your understanding was as to why you were putting white wine in cans on the flights? Same objection. Sustained foundation. Did someone ever tell you that Mr. Jackson wanted wine placed in soda cans because he didn't want children to see it? Objection. Same objection. Sustained. Why did you hide those little bottles of alcohol so children couldn't get to them? I wanted to make sure that that Mr. Jackson and whomever he decided to inform that there was additional alcohol for grown-ups to drink and that they could at their own disposal in secrecy. We covered a lot of territory today. Ricky, final thought? Well, I think that she's a great witness for both sides. She likes Michael Jackson is my take on her. She appreciates the fact that he kept this alcohol out of the yeah. reach of children. On the other hand, she corroborates that very damning evidence that he drank alcohol yes. out of Diet Coke cans. Sean? Well, I just enjoyed the interaction between this witness and Mr. Mesereau because she never answers the question, but his question suggests to Because it's objected very clearly. to continually. Yes, yes, it's objected to so continually. So what's the point of objecting because the information is out there in front of the jury? Well, I, I, I think it's a mistake. The jurors are going to wonder why the district attorney's office didn't want her to answer this question, and the inference is only that it helped Michael Jackson. What's your overall right. read on right. the uh, expert? Real quick. I, I think the expert is so pro-prosecution that the defense will be able to make mincemeat of him with their own experts. Art? I would have loved to have cross-examined the expert. <laughs> <laughs> How was to cross-examine everybody, Sean? Yes, well, he, again, it's so tailor-made that he begins to lose credibility. And will that rub up against the expert for the defense and the expert who actually talked to this kid? That's really going to be the real issue. We'll see what happens. Well, be sure to catch our exclusive Michael Jackson trial coverage every weeknight, 9 p.m., right here on E. We'll see you tomorrow.